pleasure to be here and uh, thank you Business World for uh, putting this uh, wonderful platform together. Um, so we've got with us a bunch of esteemed uh, panelists and uh, we'd like to keep the session a bit interactive so we will open it up for questions in the last 10 to 15 minutes so that we can get uh, audience participation as well. Um, probably we will just begin with a quick round of introductions before we uh, move into our main questions. So, uh, so I am Ajay Rao, founder and uh, CEO of Emisa. Uh, Emisa is primarily a, a fulfillment platform for D2C brands. We, we help a lot of D2C brands uh, scale their online and offline business through our network of fulfillment centers across the country and provide them the full stack of services, right from packaging through to warehousing and delivery. Um, I'll now ask the Akriti to introduce herself. Hi everyone, thanks for having me. I'm Akriti Rawal. I'm the co-founder of House of Chicken Curry. House of Chicken Curry deal, it's an e-commerce website where we deal in hand embroidered garments, uh, which, where garments basically embellished with chicken curry, which is an embroidery from Lucknow uh, primarily. Uh, we sell garments embellished with that and uh, we're currently selling only out of our website and uh, yeah. We have miles to go. We've started our journey just two years back. Thank you. Hello, everyone. <coughs> My name is Manas. I'm the co-founder of Beyond Snack. We make the most delicious banana chips in the world. Uh, it is available all across. I would request, please try. Uh, and we started this journey in 2020, Jan. And uh, so far, I think, you know, uh, we were fortunate enough to be present uh, all across all the channels. And uh, we have a great team in place. So a uh, lot more to do. Thanks, thanks for thanks BW, BW for hosting us. Uh, I'm Sulay, uh, founder of Palmer. Uh, we are also about a three-year-old company um, featured on Shark Tank uh, in season one. Uh, we're predominantly an underwear brand. Started off as an underwear brand for men and women both. Uh, over time, we've uh, expanded into the loungewear category. Uh, we most of uh, mostly a brand which is very largely focused on building our own design. Uh, uh, being extremely quirky and not getting into the whole uh, black, blue, white uh, sort of underwear category. Uh, so typically, innerwear built for millennials by millennials. Uh, and that's been our journey. Uh, over to you, Sahil. Hi, everyone. I'm Sahil Malik. Uh, we're in the space of luxury. And uh, we run two brands, uh, Da Milano and Rosso Brunello. Da Milano, of course, in uh, handbags and uh, leather goods. And uh, Rosso Brunello primarily into footwear. Uh, we are we are almost a hundred uh, store brand. Uh, this year we'll be completing hundred stores, and present in uh, 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 five countries. So that's what we are. So the the theme of today's discussion is uh, is sort of decoding the new D two C themes, right? Uh, so primarily, if you look at it today, right, um, the the buzzword is D two C, but actually people call them sort of the new age brands, right? And if you look at India today as a country, right, we've uh, largely been brand brand starved right if you look at the brands that we've grown up with over over the last so many years many of them are sort of international brands that have come into india created a base here and of course there are quite a few uh, uh, homegrown brands as well but as a country the number of brands that we really have compared to the western world is far far less right and uh, with d2c coming in and with these new age consumer brands coming in there is really a platform now uh, for india to sort of uh, produce a whole lot of new brands for our the younger generation to engage with and sort of grow up with. Uh, but in the backdrop of this, I think the key is sort of uh, creating permanence, right? How do you actually sort of create a brand that's not just the flavor of the month or the flavor of the season, but actually becomes a brand that sort of stands the test of time? Um, so there are a lot of things that go into sort of building these kind of brands out in terms of sustainability, profitability, uh, investments and a whole lot. So the idea of today's session is to sort of talk about some of uh, the challenges that sort of uh, brands face and how can they overcome these challenges to become sort of the permanent brands of the future going forward, right? Um, so I think the first sort of uh, question that I would like to sort of talk about is when you're creating a brand, right, you've got uh, sort of two or three main platforms. You've got your own website, you've got marketplaces, and then you've got offline, right? Uh, but most of the new age brands start with marketplaces. So I think I want to spend a little bit of time on that in terms of uh, for a brand, what is your cost of customer acquisition? Where should you put your money? How much money should you spend in terms of performance marketing on marketplaces versus your own website? And how do you sort of do your budget allocation? So I think a little bit of 
uh, thoughts around this. I'd uh, like to force first call upon uh, Sule to, to talk upon. Sure. So um, I think uh, predominantly uh, when we started off, the whole idea around the brand was that let's start by building a D2C focused D2C first brand, right? Because that's originally what the whole idea of D2C even really means. Um, and for us, uh, for the first sort of two, two and a half years of our business, um, we've largely, we largely remained very D2C focused. Um, and I was very conscious about this. The reason being that um, I know marketplaces could have been not easy, but could have at least given us the volume that we needed in the initial days to at least help push the brand get our consumers aware of the brand. But at the same time, I think what would have been missed um, was the direct feedback that we've been getting from consumers by being D2C first. Uh, even today, um, over three years, obviously, we have established the brand D2C. Um, so even today, close to about 85% of our business is still D2C. Um, and it, even while we keep pushing marketplaces, D2C pushes it further. Um, the reason for that being, I think we've already sort of established or, or there's a certain recall for the brand in the D2C space. And the most interesting thing that I enjoy about still being D2C first is the immediate feedback, the ability to retarget our consumers back and forth, the ability to own that consumer data. Um, so I think that's where the journey has been. Um, we've not really gone offline as yet. I think there's a lot of time for before we actually can do that. Uh, marketplaces are doing very well, again, uh, uh, gives phenomenal volumes, uh, but again, uh, we have zero control in terms of ownership of our consumers, so uh, that's probably something that I don't enjoy at all. Uh, but beyond that, I think uh, both channels have worked very well for us so far. Great. Uh, Sahil, you come from a retail first uh, background. I think that's sort of what you share differently compared to the, the other panelists. Um, so in terms of your transition from offline to online, how have you sort of played with marketplaces versus uh, your own website and budget allocations? And yeah, so of course offline is a is much more longer and time consuming sort of a reaching out to your consumers. It takes a lot of time. Uh, online, you know, you can, you can reach to your consumers much more faster. Of course, it's got its own uh, positives and uh, negatives. But uh, considering that we've been into the space of luxury and uh, it's it's always been that you know it has to be your consumer connect ha is most critical and I we have I have always been a firm believer that uh, you know keeping that in mind that how do you keep a constant uh, touch with the consumer how do you so so what we've been doing in our in offline presence is that we were one of the first brands in the country to launch our CRM program which really uh, the stickiness came through that and uh, our frequent uh, innovations in in collections in and then uh, so so uh, uh, so d you know if you have a direct co touch with the co consumer at all the times and that's and we we've, we've always kept our team very lean so that there are not too many layers uh, f uh, you know with, with with the customer and and the, the message goes very quick to the customer so so those those parameters have uh, really helped us to grow offline with a with, with a, a d2c sort of a connect with the customers um, we we ventured online almost about five years ago, where, uh, uh, but again uh, through our own uh, channel por portal, uh, through our own websites. Uh, we we uh, because of the reason that you know we wanted to keep the control on on uh, on our product, on on training, on um, um, on uh, let's say discount factors. So so uh, 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 you know and and by then the the marketplaces in evolved and. Then we started to, uh, you know, uh, get in touch with very selected marketplaces. But the the control still lies with us in terms of discounting, in terms of what product will go there. We've started to produce a separate range for, for uh, uh, marketplace. And uh, so there's no so what you would see uh, there's a tw twenty percent with thirty percent variance in the collection from uh, marketplace and our online or offline stores. Uh, in the interim, we also decided how do we keep. So we don't have any any channel, any any mid mid middlemen uh, in our entire journey. So all hundred stores are all, uh, except for Nepal, where we've got a franchisee. But across other four countries, we are all having our own uh, setup. Uh, so so we thought that how do we really d build a D two C sort of a connect and continue with this concept. Uh, so so we evolved as different channels. We we started travel retail as a, as a, today we have 20 stores across the airports. You know 
we've got our own exclusive stores. We're, we're, we've opened about 15 stores which are at uh, the office complexes. So, so that, that's a biz that's a that's Da Milano business concept, where we have a very uh, you know we've got very impulsive products, so all gifting products. So, so one of the store in Aero City, and then a couple of stores in the uh, uh, towers where the uh, the corporates are there. Uh, so that's how we've kept ourselves to connected to B two C sort of hairstyle. Uh, Manas, uh, from a food perspective, since you uh, sort of largely into a snacking category, right? So how is the marketplace versus uh, website uh, strategy for you? Sure. So I, I was listening to both the stories, and I somewhere fall in between <laughs> <laughs> these two. Uh, so I believe that where is your customer discovery happening, right? You know, that is where you need to be there. And I think that as a snacking being an impulse category, uh, our journey was never into uh, proper through our website. It was definitely through our marketplace initially because how often a people, how often uh, someone will search for the best banana on Google, right? You know, so our discovery is predominantly happening on Amazon or over these marketplaces. So we started from there, and our shift also is slowly towards the other side, which is the retail uh, or the uh, the offline channel, right? Uh, so we we believe that you know being you know look look at. Um, the kind of the product that you are in and the type of utility and also how the consumer is uh, shaping the purchasing pattern. And based on that, uh, we should be completely present in that trade channel. And for us, that would be predominantly in the marketplaces and and uh, and uh, all the retail channels. And I was surprised to hear the numbers that you said. 80% uh, is coming from website, and in our case, it is the other way around. 70% is coming from all the marketplaces. So, so that's how mm, I think you see the contrasting uh, uh, trade channel right you know so do you think it's more category based or is it uh, yes yes it is more not category based i think you know, within the category also you should look at the product and where exactly the discovery of your product consumer discovery happens on on which way right you know and be there is the most important thing uh, yeah so so how do you figure that out the consumer discovery process right so where how do you figure out where your consumers are, what do you do for that? Yeah, so in our case, look at it, you know, so it's an impulse buying, right? You know, right. that is the first question. So we look at where exactly consumer will uh, go and buy the product, right? Uh, the same question, how often people will, so if it is a, um, so in, in Bummer's case, people will definitely look at what is a, the most comfortable fabric, right? That would be a driving point. That right. search will be happening on Google. But how often people will search for the best banana chips or the or the soulful crunch banana chip? People will not search that in <laughs> on a, on, a, on a Google, right? You know, but people will definitely uh, go to Amazon and search for best banana chips or maybe banana chips, right? You know, so that is where the discovery. So ask yourself that question, and maybe when you start investing a little bit of money on different platform, you will understand that uh, where is which platform is working well for you and accordingly. No, that's a uh, very interesting uh, perspective there. So I think uh, the next question really, again, like I said, it's the whole idea is to sort of build your own base of customers, right, through through engagement. And uh, so brands today are spending a huge amount of money on Facebook and Google marketing. In fact, there's a very interesting uh, study which says that almost 60% of all VC money spent globally goes back to Facebook and Google, uh, Google right? So basically, we're putting money back in Facebook and Google's uh, uh, pockets. So the question now is for a brand to sort of scale sustainably. How do you sort of develop strategies to engage and uh, attract customers outside of Facebook and uh, Google? So it will be good to understand maybe if Akriti, you can, you built a very successful D2C business. How have you uh, attracted customers, right? So for House of Chicken Curry, you know, when we started out, uh, we are a two-year-old brand approximately. We launched in October 2020. And for the first 10 months, uh, First 10 to 11 months, our brand was only based out of Instagram and WhatsApp. We didn't even have a website. So to retarget or target customers using you know, Pixel or Facebook or Google, something which was very limited for us for the first 11 months. Because that time, we were kind of piloting, and we were trying to understand if there's demand for you know, what we're trying to bring to the customers. And are people like, you know, loving the brand or the product as much as we think they would? So uh, when we were not focusing on Facebook and Google, we had to kind of rely on other methods to you know, get our uh, visibility out there or get people to our Instagram page more than anything. Our budgets were hardly like negligible for the first 11 months for paid performance marketing. Uh, so we relied a lot on, you know, uh, strategies that would get cheaper audience and uh, to our Instagram page, which involved influencer marketing to a very large extent. And I think our brand till today, like we believe in not just building our relationships with our customers, but also like, you know, with our influencers. 
we used to like capitalize on uh, micro influencers who would you know when we were small say you know 2000 followers uh, they would agree to you know do a barter sort of collaboration with, with us because they also want to grow so we capitalized on that a lot in our early days and we still do i think that sort of helps us a lot in bringing the brand's visibility out that's been i think very important to us as much as facebook and google has been in our strategies apart from that i think uh, social media is one way where brands can you know uh, bring like audience at a much uh, like you know sort of organic content by making like content that resonates with uh, younger people today or you know si sort of has that uh, virality uh, effect going on through reels like you have to capitalize on short video formats that you know what that's what the audience wants that's what is working it's not something that we as brands you know are forcing on people it's what's working with the audience and we are just following the trend and you know trying to basically give the audience what they want uh, while telling our stories so organic social media content is something also that you know we focus on a lot we try to bring authenticity and the brand trust out through short video formats youtube is coming out with you know uh, youtube shorts and uh, that is a new platform you know that we are also exploring currently uh, because it's not too crowded right now so that's something we're trying to explore where we believe we can you know get audience at a much uh, you know lower cost and i think it's an extreme necessity to keep venturing out and trying you know different ways because uh, we also launched in covid and covid was the boom of d2c you know the paid performance the return the roi the roi the roas on ads was not as strong compared to you know when i would speak to people who had brands that were 5 6 years old and they would be like yeah 5x is something that you know you need to do a minimum of and that benchmark 5x success was set in our heads but to actually get that return on ads uh, became very difficult because it was too overcrowded and the cost of acquisition was too high so we didn't really have a choice but to venture out into other things so that the overall business roi you know sort of becomes on the higher side and yeah for retention uh, like you know of people and retargeting and bringing them back to your website something like email marketing and whatsapp marketing really helps us you know retarget our own audience our own community at a much lower cost so these are some of the ways you know we've been trying to get the overall roi up of the business what's your return rate like uh, repeat, 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 repeat customers repeat. about 34 uh, percent yeah month on month wow that's amazing uh, Sule you've got almost 75 80 percent purely on D2C right so what are some of your cheaper growth hacks that you can suggest so um, yeah absolutely so I think um, by and large I feel that strong brand building has been um, one of the core and, and that that's I mean regardless of how the the, the product turns out to be or or uh, I know that's uh, one of the most important factors, generally speaking. But but I think in our case, brand building, how we build the brand, how we design the brand, has been probably one of the most core important factors in consumers sort of having a strong recall. Um, there's a strong social media presence. Uh, um, the way we sort of have designed campaigns, the way we've plugged in the name mm -hmm. of Palmer generally uh, stands out. Something that that was said out loud on Shark Tank as well, right? Um, the name Bummer in itself has a very strong sort of uh, memory recollect per se. Um, so I think uh, generally speaking for us largely today, close to about 40% of our acquisition, between 35 and 40% of our acquisition is purely organic, um, right? Um, and this was almost a similar ratio, slightly lower, uh, close to about 20-30% uh, pre-Shark Tank. Um, these are folks who probably followed us on social media, came through us, yeah, Google, for example, cannot emphasize how important SEO is, um, which is you know probably beyond um, the pumping spends into FP and Google. Um, for example, like a small example um, for Valentine's Day, uh, you know, it's we we do as a part of the brand. We do couples underwear, we do matching underwear as a part of the brand. Um, slightly offbeat concept, but it does wonders. Um, we launched glow in the dark underwear, which is like a limited edition sort of a thing uh, for this this particular month. And in 10 days of the entire month, we had completely sold out over 10,000 odd units. And we saw almost 80% of our users actually coming back just to buy that one print, even if they had just bought 15 days ago from, from Bummer, right? So I think, I think do, having strong internal product innovation also, in my opinion, this was the first time we did it, but it worked very well. So now my mind is thinking, what do I do next that's going to help me do the same, repeat the exact same mechanism probably for some other occasion or some other event in, in the consumer life cycle. That's very interesting. So I think, I think innovation is at the heart of, yeah. heart of this, right? But 
to constantly keep innovating day after day, month after month, uh, is a challenge. And coming back to sort of the theme, right? If we want to sort of create uh, the new brands of India, right, going forward and have sort of a permanent mind share, um, you know, and being able to compete with the HULs and and the larger brands that have sort of now occupied our uh, our mind. What are some of the things that we have to do fundamentally to sort of create permanence, right? In that, over the next ten years, because I was at an event on Saturday and uh, there was a gentleman from Wow Skin Sciences, one of the founders, Manish. So he said that look, even at their scale, they can't take things for granted, right? Um, you, only after you cross ten years can you really sort of consider yourself to be sort of permanently out there. So what are some of the things that we need to do, or these new age brands need to do to create that permanence and become the brands of uh, tomorrow, Akriti, maybe if you want to take that. So when House of Chicken Curry, you know, started, uh, we had the advantage that no one was primarily in the chicken curry industry online at a larger scale. So that was the benefit that we had starting out. But you know, we were still competing with some of the biggest brands in Indian wear. We were still indirectly competing with the Fab India. You know, we're still competing with uh, Biba. So they were all brands that are already existing at a certain price point. Have a certain sense of recall and the community that you know of their audience. So uh, I it it's, you know Fab India does chicken curry. They were not solely chicken curry, but they do. So you know what do we do differently to make a customer not go to Fab India? Our price points are pretty similar to Fab India. That's why the direct relevance. So uh, you know what should we do that you know come to a brand that they don't even know about and they don't they haven't even seen. They have like thousand followers on the page. So I feel uh, the strategy that has helped us and still helps us as a new age brand. Our uh, target audience is somewhere around, you know, less than 35 years of age. So between 20 to 35 is what our direct audience is. And they're all millennials. So what resonates with millennials and does resonate, you know, with the audience that our brand has is that we focused a lot on creating that trust through uh, auth being authentic and being very, uh, you know, real. Uh, that sort of worked, I think, uh, the best for us on our social media, and uh, we, I think, we've stopped posting professional shoots on our social media because we've realized that the reach uh, would go down every time we would post a professionally shot photo. Whereas when we're posting, you know, a real photo of a customer, mm -hmm. our audience is loving that, and uh, I think that is somewhere like you know set the uh, guidelines for us for our social media that we want to be as real as it gets. We don't filter out any customer who ever shares a photo we just share it back. And there is no filtering out of any sort because we want to keep it real. And this, not on just the customer front, what goes behind the scenes is something we focus on a lot. How do we design a product? Which is, who's the team? What is, like every team, and we have 60 people in operations. We have a team of 90 people in all now. And uh, you know, everyone who's involved, like in dispatch to say packaging to the embroidery, like we, we've shown their story on our social media platform because we believe that that's what our audience kind of wants. And I think that's the two-year journey that we've had. This has been a very <coughs> strong factor why we've built a community where, say, 35%, you know, people are coming back month on month, and you know, they've uh, they've also we also take feedback very seriously. You know, they've not just been good reviews. There's been people who've given us good feedback on the, the say the fabric or the embroidery quality. So uh, we've taken all that into account. But the authenticity that we've built around the brand has helped us, you know, stand out and you know get a sh little share of the big giants that they are. So that's helped us a lot. Great. So, so authenticity, keeping it real is what you're saying. I think we're down to about five minutes. I'd like to sort of maybe open up the, the floor to questions from the, uh, the audience, right? So uh, if anybody has a question, you can raise your hand and we can. Kashmiri products, uh, predominantly shawls and scarves. Uh, we're a completely bootstrap venture. And hence, uh, we banked in the last three years purely on organic growth. Uh, we could not really get the idea of influencer marketing that much in India because we always focus that our market is US and Europe to to sell at a better value addition and a, bat and a better reach. Uh, so 90% of the business we do is from US and Europe. Your and not question, from sir, if you don't mind. Yeah. So sorry. Um, the basic question is when is the right time to push from organic to performance marketing? Uh, when do you see that to be the right, right market fit as a decision for it? Uh, secondly, in terms of international markets, if anyone can answer, what would be the right medium to push the marketing and growth? You know, I would, uh, we, we are present in almost about five countries now. And uh, um, I would give my perspective on the offline side because uh, <coughs> uh, we've been uh, present uh, 
uh, we entered through exclusive channels. We opened stores in the malls, and we are uh, in one of the best malls across Middle East and <coughs> the other uh, countries of Middle East. Um, um, uh, of course, that's a slower way to, to penetrate, but uh, I think uh, internationally, uh, online channels have, bit have been very matured, and, and uh, um, you could probably choose the, the, the best channel, the best marketplace where uh, uh, you know, the right competition would be, which could, which could, blend, which could just blend with your brand and, uh, and your product. So, so any specific market you recommend or any specific entry strategy for a young brand? So what's your core product? Out of four of you on the panel, I think three of you represent brands, which is either impulse or luxury and mostly for the millennial as an audience, millennial or Gen Z. Uh, people who are trying to build D2C businesses for seniors as a segment uh, in a health and wellness space, let's say, which helps them age well or age positively. What is it that you would say as learnings? What are some of the things, uh, core principles that we should keep in mind? Anyone or maybe more Can than I one? Can I add just something? So uh, our primarily our audience is you know millennials. But because we're into Indian wear, we do get a lot of inquiries from people who are, you know, in the age bracket of say over 40 or 50. And even internationally, like a lot of our customers were over the age of 50, 55. But internationally, they're very well versed with the tech and ordering online. So the journey, their journey becomes much easier, even though we're e-commerce. But I think the biggest learning we've had is that if we ever want to reach the audience that, you know, you're talking about, in India, we need to go offline as well. So that is the biggest like learning that we've had as a brand that in India the like they're not that comf they also want assistance say on a call they don't they're not comfortable with WhatsApp so they do want us to be available on call to guide them how to place an order or you know be present offline so we get a lot of requests where we, they want to come to our warehouse to just view the products so we've realized that that is a need that you know currently like we are not uh, those are the customers we're not currently not catering to but if we ever decide to venture into that target audience we will definitely have to take the offline route as well. Yes, I think that you need to look at, you know, there are two things, you know, customer and a consumer. Your consumer may be the person who is above 50 or maybe 60, but the person who is purchasing uh, the customer, you really have to, you know, your brand narrative and the story should be appealing to them so that mostly they will be the people who will be buying it for their, their elder people, right? You know, so if you are taking that D2C, your brand story and narrative would be more in line with, uh, you know, aligned with the people who, uh, you know, huh, but who is going to purchase or m maybe they, they don't be that huh, well versed with the technology or maybe uh, you know, buying it from a website. But the younger crowd or maybe their their sons and daughters might be then. Then you need to accordingly place it so that you know it appeals to them also. Great. I think with that we are times up and uh, just want to just thank the panelists Akriti, Manas, Sule, Sahil. Thank you for your time and uh, for the valuable insights that you've shared. <laughs>